Uh, Jeff will be reading from the ninth chapter of Luke, verses 28 through 43, if you'd like to follow along or follow along on the screen. The Transfiguration. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up into a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving, Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I, ha whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met them. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. O oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the evil spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to the father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Listen carefully what I'm about to tell you. Thank you, Jeff. It's interesting that uh, last week we looked at, or a few weeks ago, we looked at Jesus, well, it was actually last week, Jesus going up to a mountain and calling all of his disciples up and then choosing 12 of them and then descended to a level place and began to minister. And here again, Jesus is transfigured probably on Mount Hermon, this great huge mountain in the north of Israel. And then he descends again and casts out the demon in this child, which is a reminder to us that God gives us insight so that we can invade the world. God gives us insight, gives us vision, gives us knowledge to empower us to then go into the world and invade it with the good news of Christ. Now, the sermon I'm about to preach is uh, written actually by a man named Michael Reniger. And the reason I want to preach this sermon is because... Often I run into people who have a very different perspective than I do. I would not have preached the sermon in the way that he preaches it, but I found it very powerful and helpful. Uh, and so I'm going to take his sermon, and I've reworked it a little bit, and I'm going to preach this message. The original title of the message was, Let Me Put On My Lipstick. Okay. Their mother had died. As we sat together, they told stories about her life and her faith and the strength that she had shown during her illness. One story stood out in my mind. They told me about her first surgery. 
The operation took place late in the day, and her family could not see her until early the next morning. So when her daughters arrived at the hospital bright and early the next day, they expected to see their mother in the hospital bed with IVs and tubes and bandages and a look of exhaustion on her face. Instead, when they walked in the room, they found that their mother had gotten up early and asked the nurses to give her a bath and wash her hair. Then despite her fatigue and the constant pain, she applied her makeup and did her hair. Her daughters were amazed. Mom looked wonderful. The nurse pulled them aside later and said, your mom wanted to look radiant for you because she did not want you to worry. I'll bet you've known people like this. People who are suffering, struggling, perhaps facing death. We think we're taking care of them, but they are really taking care of us. And no matter how they're feeling physically, their love is radiating. They carry themselves with grace and beauty. Chris and I had a friend who passed away about six years ago. Her name was Jeanette. She was a great Christian woman, never smoked, never drank, always great clean habits, and she contracted lung cancer. And as she was dying, as I would speak with her, she would say these words, I want even my dying to glorify God. Michael Reniger, who writes this message, says, I remember the last Thanksgiving that we had with my mother. She was in the midst of horrible chemo. She was so physically weak. But there she was on Thanksgiving Day sitting in her chair at the end of the table. She wanted everything to be perfect for us because that's what moms do. And despite her pain, she dressed herself beautifully and she smiled. And though she couldn't eat what she prepared, she prepared all of our favorite dishes. And we knew that we were losing her. But was, she was so full of love. And there were several times during that last Thanksgiving when I just looked at my dying mother and I said to myself, she's radiant. That's what Luke is saying today about Jesus. Jesus is radiant. But his radiance finds its deeper meaning in the fact of, in in fact in mind that in Luke's gospel, Jesus' transfiguration occurs between two crucial moments just before Jesus takes the three disciples up to the Mount of Transfiguration. He says some very hard but honest words. If you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Jesus loves us enough to tell us the truth. If we're going to follow him, it's going to cost us something. Because the kingdom cost him everything. We must follow him right to the cross. This is the invitation of self-giving, self-emptying love. The call to give our lives away. That is the message of Jesus that he gives before Peter, James, and John up on the mountain. And then just after a few verses after the transfiguration, we, occur, we hear Jesus resolutely, he sets his face towards Jerusalem. The place of his suffering and his death. The place where he will die on the cross. So the glory of the transfiguration takes place in the midst of Jesus' willingness to make his way to Jerusalem, the place of his suffering and death. And it takes place in the midst of Jesus' invitation for us to follow him passionately to the place of our self-giving, self-actualization where we can now set ourselves aside and be servants and lovers of each other. This scene of the transfiguration takes place as Jesus is underway on his journey to Jerusalem to die. 
Death is always hunting him down. The religious leaders have already concluded Jesus must die. And Jesus knows it. He already predicts his crucifixion. Death is on the horizon. And it is precisely then, in the midst of suffering and death that are hovering in the air, that Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to the mountain. He becomes radiant before their eyes. Everything about him, from his clothing to his face, is transfigured into something glorious. And the timing of this, or the timing of this, may seem strange. Why would the transfiguration of Jesus take place just then, in the middle of all this talk about death and suffering? As I think about the question, I think maybe perhaps Jesus is taking care of his disciples. Remember, these are the three same disciples that would go with him to the Garden of Gethsemane and watch Jesus sweat drops of blood. They will see him arrested. They will see him die. They will see the worst happen to him. But in this moment of transfiguration, he is giving them a glimpse of what is the best. A glimpse of resurrection. And a glimpse of what eternal life looks like. What glory looks like. He's giving them a glimpse. He is showing them that even though impending death is coming, nothing can steal his nobility and his dignity as he follows his Father's will. He is showing all of us what our future holds if we listen to him and follow Him. Like anyone who's facing suffering or struggles or death, Jesus had choices to make. He could have chosen to become self-centered, focused on His approaching pain, His own sacrifice, but instead He chose to do what so many noble souls have done even as death hunts them down. He radiated love. He radiated beauty. He radiated the glory of God the Father. In that moment, everything about Him was pointing to a future full of hope. The transfiguration of Jesus is one way that God promises all of us that there is always hope. That every person can at least at some level change. That there will always be a way to start anew. On that mountaintop, God gave us a glimpse of how the terrible tragedy of Jesus' death was going to be transformed, transfigured into something glorious on Easter morning. And if the Father can do that for His Son, can do that for all of His daughters and sons, God loves us. He sent Jesus to die and was raised for us. That risen Jesus is walking beside us. And because of that, God is saying to us that no matter what our suffering is, no matter what sacrifice we're called to make, no matter what cross we are carrying, the Almighty God can transfigure our dying into glorious rising. If He can do that for me, God can do that for anyone. Which means that there is no one on earth that God is willing to give up on. And if God is not giving up on people, how can I give up on them? If God is not giving up on any situation, then how can I give up on any situation? And if God refuses to say that some problems can't be solved, then how can I throw up my hands and declare nothing can be done? And nothing should be tried. And there is no hope. If we pay attention, we may discover that the transfiguration and transfigurations are happening all around us. Which brings me back to the lady in the hospital room. Even in her illness, she chose to radiate life. Even at the Thanksgiving table, as 
Michael's mother was struggling. She chose to radiate love. And so many people who are being hunted down by death choose to radiate joy and tenderness and forgiveness and mercy. As one person said to me after his wife had died, even when something as ugly as death was on the horizon, she chose to create something beautiful. Even though something ugly was on the horizon, she chose to create something beautiful. What would happen if you and I, with the help of God's power, God's grace, chose to create something beautiful, no matter what is surrounding us? What if we chose to be transfigured by God's love? Even when the struggles and even the crosses we bear are all around us. How would the world be changed if we chose to radiate something beautiful and graceful in every moment and situation? If we chose to radiate Christ's beauty, even when everyone else in our family is filled with anger or impatience or judgment, what would it be like if we chose to radiate Christ's beauty when our friends and neighbors are filled with gossip and pettiness? What would it be like if we chose to radiate Christ's beauty even when our spouse has withdrawn or hurts us or ignores us? If we chose to radiate God's beauty when everyone else around us is passing judgment on the poor, speaking harshly of the immigrant, denying the dignity of human life, what if we chose Christ's beauty even when our colleagues at work have created a harsh and horrible work environment? What if we chose to radiate Christ's beauty even when acts of terror and violence and aggression seem to be the preferred method of response in our society? And what if we chose to radiate Christ's beauty when every fiber of our being is telling you that it's okay to be selfish. It's okay to be self-centered. It's okay to complain and gripe about what's happening to you. What if we chose to radiate beauty? There was an Episcopal church that was having their Christmas pageant, which was a carbon copy of most Christmas pageants around the country. Only this one, at a critical moment, a little nine-year-old girl said something that the people of that church will never forget. The manger was in front, as always, and young Mary was wrapped in her blue mantle, and Joseph sported a, a beard glued together with cotton balls. The wise men there were two, and there were shepherds, and in the middle of them all was the baby Jesus lying in the manger. The nativity was read, carols were sung, and everything was going well without a hitch. Well, almost. And various children were the angelic hosts. They were robed in white and sitting beside their moms and dads throughout the church. And at the right moment, they were to come up and circle the manger and sing, Glory to God in the highest, on earth and peace and goodwill to men. And so they did, but there was a problem. One of the little angels, one of the little girls, couldn't see the baby Jesus. And she said these words, Let him show! And the Episcopal priest ended the service right there. Let him show. And that's what the transfiguration is about. This Jesus who was transfigured full of the glory and the radiance of God, fulfilling the law and the prophets, fulfilling all the promises of Scripture. This is the Jesus whom the voice out of the cloud says, this is not my beloved Son. The Word has changed from Jesus' baptism. This is the one I have chosen. Jesus supersedes even Moses and Elijah. He is the chosen one. And we are to let Him show. 
in whatever manner we can, at any time we can, anywhere we can.